Welcome to our midweek Bible class. Ephesians chapter 5, as we go through the New Testament books in the order in which they were written. Uh, and again, we had several options when we started with Ephesians. Ephesians 5 is where we are, because several of them were written about the same time. So we're going to hit, hit a cluster. Remember that Ephesians is written to the people in Ephesus. They are <clears throat> Gentiles, and by the main, there was a, a large Jewish community there that had also uh, accepted Christ. But uh, Ephesus was pagan central. Remember Diana of the Ephesians and the riots that broke out. So Paul's writing saved people, but talking to them about how to live now that they're saved. It's... Um, it's not so that they will be saved, but rather this is how saved people are to behave. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as, as always, I'm allergic to the red dot on my, uh, my iPhone. Everything's fine until I try to record. Ephesians 5, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If you've been tuning in, you know how this fits in. And I'm not going to review too much because those lessons are online. They remain free due to the generosity of people who pay my salary and pay for the equipment that puts this out there. Thank you. Uh, these will remain free and you can copy them, you can download them however you wish. <clears throat> Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Again, they're already saved. This is just to teach them how to be saved. Uh, I'm sorry, how to act saved. They are saved. This is to show them now, now that you're in the family, this is how God wants you to act. You're dearly loved children, so let's work on this. And he does bring up something here, don't miss this, that Christ loved us. Live a life of love just as Christ did. But the way Christ did that required Christ giving himself up. That phrase is going to come into play again in this chapter. Um, it's important, therefore, that you understand it. And the word head that we got out of chapter 4 is going to come into play later in this chapter. So don't miss it. To live a life of love means a life of sacrifice, of giving. Now, we could beat this one like a dead horse all around the, the fairground here, but I don't think we need to. If you have children, you will love them, but they are costly in terms of money, time, effort, worry, sleep, all of that. But it's worth it. We, you know, we, we say it's worth it, and I believe that it is. And grandkids even more. Uh, they're, they're better in every way, but still expensive, right? The life of sacrifice is a, is a good life. And as Jesus lived it, there were some brutal things that happened because of it. And then he calls us to follow him along. You do this too. You live like Jesus. Live a life of love. And one of the things, however, that has to be pulled out uh, of this is the selfishness that comes from when we take our desires and we make them trump love. Therefore, we're willing to use other people. We're willing to lie to other people. That was in chapter 4. And here, he's going to talk about misusing people sexually. He says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. The pagan worship in Ephesus was very, very heavy into sexual acts. There was a permissiveness in the city. And Paul is just saying, remember... You need to be separate from this. You need to be different than this. He goes, um, it's just not proper. He put it, verse 4, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And we're, their verse stops there. Thought really doesn't. But let me just say a word there. I love humor. I love funny things. And I can remember years and years ago, when Sirius Radio came out and XM Radio came out, many of you may not know that they were competitors for several years before they became Sirius XM and they merged. 
And my wife got that for me as an add-on to my car <clears throat> since I drive so much. She thought, well, this will be a great benefit. And it was, you know, this was before the age of iPhones with vast music libraries in them. So it was a way to listen to music, but it was also a way to listen to radio without having to constantly change the dial as you drove across the country. Well, they also had humor channels. And I would grab onto those because I, I love to laugh. I love to be entertained by funny things. Very quickly, however, the channels began to split and they finally had this one is family safe. And it generally was stuff really old like Bob Hope or um, uh, some skits like that. It, it got to be not that fun. The other ones, I couldn't listen to. I gotta tell you guys, if, um, men and women, if you are comedians, do say funny things and say things funny, either way you wanna do it. We're not impressed with talking about sex and the F word and throwing in those. I mean, those were really shocking back in a Richard Pryor day uh, and even before then. Those, those would really get your, and people would ooh titter with, oh my goodness, they're talking about that right out in public. It is so tiresome and old now. It's not witty, it's not funny. And your, your group that finds it funny is getting smaller and smaller. God here says, don't be part of that obscene coarse talking. Don't, don't do that. You be marked by the way you to speak, by what you say and what you do not say. Because this is, this is all foolish. Rather, when you speak, speak of thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, for such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Pick your crowd. Pick your people. And while God absolutely loves all people, and while God will continue to love all people, you need to be very careful about the people that you choose to be around. And let me just... Uh, say, and I get it, I understand, for many of you. You don't get to choose to be around pure talk. Maybe you're in military or you're in a, a work situation where language like that is every day, every sentence. That is, that's awful, and I'm sorry. You don't always have the option of changing jobs. You don't often have the option of changing households when one person in the room is always like this. And I get that. And we all know this, so we may as well admit it and say it out loud. If you constantly hear it, it will be in you and it will tend to come out of you. And so Paul here is just saying, we've really got to get the whole community to speak in a different way. Now, he never gives us permission to run around and judge and yell at others, but rather to be in stark contrast to others. Uh, Lee Child has had a character who is not, um, and Jack Reacher is the character's name. He's written many books uh, starring this fellow. And this fellow is not a Christian by any means. He seems every mark to be an atheist. He does not have morality in the way that you and I would look upon morality. Um, he does not have the sexual mores of a Christian. He certainly is far more violent and murderous at times than Christians. He's a fascinating character nonetheless. And I've read, I think, every book that he wrote. And now he's backing away. And his brother, Andrew Child, is writing them. But Lee Child's name's still on there. Uh, I think that's the thing nowadays. James Patterson's name's on everything <laughs> right now. But something which hit me and there are very few exceptions. I probably read over a dozen of these before I read an article that brought up the fact that Lee Child does not have his characters use certain obscene words. 
And it hit me, that's right. Now here's a man that's able to write best-selling books have been turned into two movies and now a TV show is coming out based upon them. They are just massively popular. And this character is not a Christian, is not quoting scripture by any stretch. But he still is able to write it without any of that in there. That's interesting. It shows it's possible. So um, I think we need to work on this. By the way, unwholesome talk would include things that don't have curse words or obscenities in them. It could be gossip. It could be slander. Any of those things. They, they just don't belong in us. So, you were once darkness, he says. But now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Wouldn't that be great to have on your doorway or on the dashboard of your vehicle? Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So what does it mean to be a child of the light? All goodness, righteousness, and and truth. Remember the truth is always, always tempered by love. That was in that last chapter. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That last bit, by the way, uh, many of your study Bibles will have little notes that this goes to John 5 or over here to a psalm. Th this is um, most scholars that I've checked on this, in fact, almost all of them, say that Paul is quoting a line out of a Christian hymn of the day. Uh, he liked songs, and he quoted them several times, actually. So did um, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. He quoted several hymns that people were singing and had some of them even sung by the angels in heaven, which I think is pretty cool to think that angels in heaven join us in some of our songs. So anyway, everything exposed by the light becomes visible. The light of Christ is going to show everything. So let's be very careful that we don't live in the dark thinking that dark will protect us. When I was a boy, my parents um, were very, very strict that no alcohol, not even in something like NyQuil was in the house. And I remember uh, natural curiosity, when you drive by and you see these low buildings, dark windows that you couldn't see through, and there'd be beer signs or something on them. And I'd, I'd say, what, what's in there? And they'd oh, it's, oh, it's awful. Then later, as I would ask more questions, they would, I'd say, well, why is it always dark? The response was, because that's where you go do what you don't want people to see you do. A bit of an overstatement, but the general principle I found useful in my life. If you have to go to where something is dark to do what you want to do, you might want to think about this. You might want to think about, all right, you know, Let's, let's, are we living as children of light? Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The, um, that verse has been translated so many different ways. One of my favorite ways says redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming, buying back the time. I don't believe there's any wrong with having hobbies uh, and I don't believe there's anything wrong with spending time doing nothing as long as that's just not what you do all the time but there are times for rest Sabbath very much required God said you were created in such a way that you needed rest periods and so yeah rest but whenever you work think about the best way to do this, think about not, not wasting your life, not getting anywhere, and then just doing the same thing again, just repeating the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. And let me give you an example of what I believe is going on here. You live this way and you end up being miserable. You live this way and again, last chapter, 
it doesn't satisfy your appetites. You have appetites and therefore you act upon them, but they're not being satisfied. Why don't you redeem the time? Why don't you learn to make the most of the day's opportunity by trying something else, by doing something different, seeing if that makes it better. And it could be, for example, um, a change in the way that you experience food or sex or work or an argument. If you've argued with somebody over and over and you're not getting anywhere, maybe arguing is not the way to get there. Maybe there's another way that we could live our life that would be more fruitful, that would be more effective. So again, we'd have to look at what part of your life isn't working. Now, what can we do about that? What can we change? What new skill can we learn? What therapy do we need to go to? Or do we need to get some geographical distance? Figure out how best to use your life. We have a program on our phone that many of you would have on yours called Waze. And Waze will track out, you know, the way I need to get to here, there, or the other. We use it instead of the onboard Google Maps or any of the TomToms or Navis, any of those we used to use. One of the favorite things about it is that you can actually change the voice on Waze. And our grandsons do the voice for us. There's a way that you can do that. And if don't write me because I don't know how. It was just really a gift from our daughter. Uh, and so our boys direct us around the country. Love it. Whenever that lays out, every so often we're driving down the road that we were told to drive down. And we will hear my 12 year old grandson's voice vaguely disapproving saying rerouting. Now we didn't make a wrong turn. And so it took us a while cause we're not sharp to look and see that the route had actually changed because of something which was ahead. There was too much traffic here. There was a blockage over here. There was an accident over here, somehow actively working us. Now the other, um, we bought a years ago, uh, one of those standalone navigation units that were the, the rage, it was TomTom Tom or Garmin. And it was said to um, come with lifetime traffic. And it would, it would spot a traffic jam 10 minutes after you were in it. Paul's saying, don't live like this. Be more like Waze. Keep your eyes out of here and just, your eyes out in front rather. Watch, figure out what's working, what isn't working. Make adjustments. Don't waste your life. Be involved in it. Take part in your own life. Make some changes. Then uh, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled by the Spirit. Now, some of the old translations don't be drunk, drunk with wine, but be drunk with the spirit. Actually capture the flavor of this two phrase passage. You can look at this and say, well, we're not to drink wine. It's not what it says. In fact, the Bible mentions wine and beer in many positive ways. As you go through, the beer is more subtle. You have to know how to find it. Bobby Valentine, if you've never listened to his lessons or read his blogs, you really need to. Just search for him and his pod, his not podcast, his blog. Also, uh, you can find him on Facebook and he often posts long form posts that are worth every word uh, reading. But anyway, he, he has shown how these are mentioned positive, uh, positively as, as a bonus, as a blessing. But drunkenness is always wrong in scripture. It is never okay. And therefore, once again, managing our appetites appropriately. And he's saying, don't be drunk with wine because that makes you act like this, but you should have so much of the spirit in you that you seem as strange to the average person as a drunk person does, but in a different way. They should be shocked at your love, at your grace, at your peace just because you are a child of light when the days are dark. And whenever the days get really dark, our job is to shine brighter. Our job is not to scream that the days are dark, but to shine. And that life of love 
will come with some sacrifices. That's what was said earlier in the chapter. But it's our job. And we can do it because the Holy Spirit will give us power to do so. And then encourage each other. And so he says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, which is exactly what he did back here in verse 14. Sing to each other. Back during this time, people did not have access to scripture. Uh, there, there were scrolls, absolutely. And scholars, scribes, and such, and they knew these, these documents and they shared them, absolutely. But the common person didn't have access and couldn't just think, you know, I'd like to read such and such, you know, Obadiah, or I'd like to read Ezekiel. They didn't have that option. And so they would learn to listen when the words were read and songs were used to, um, to help people remember the stories. And that's the way that it still is in some developing countries to this day, where they will teach you songs. How many of us, whenever we are looking up uh, a book, will hear in our head a little tune of the books of the Bible in order? Or when we're trying to look something up in, a, in an index or a file, and we'll hear the ABC song in our head. Those little songs are very helpful. Well, think about that exponentially because there were songs out there that would trace the ancestry of a people all the way back to creation. Yes, it was mainly fanciful, but there were hundreds of names and the songs helped you remember your way back, therefore giving you an identity and an understanding of who you were to be in the way forward. Many you know, many historical bits and pieces, like in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and you, you get these in your head. He's saying, fill your life with these songs. Now, you, are, uh, you live in an age of technology, which is a, a, a tremendous blessing. And, and yes, there are curses, but that's always the way of things. You can listen to, you know, Fish or The Way or K-Love, that's one way to do it. Another way is one of our young girls, who's a preteen at our safe harbor, <coughs> and you've seen her read scripture and you've seen her collect the communion cups and you've seen them uh, sing songs. Well, her favorite book is the old sacred selections for the church or great songs of the church, one of the big song books. And her parents say that she has uh, little markers, little sheets of paper, all through it of her favorite songs and that she'll sit there for hours and go through the songs. That's somebody who, when her faith hits crises later in her life, will have words to help her because she's memorized the songs and she's able to do the songs back and forth. And as somebody who's worked a great deal in the field of Alzheimer's, I can tell you that it's, it is just endemic. It's everywhere that one of the last things to leave a person are the songs. They can know all the words to a song and not know where they are or who you are, but the song remains. So songs are powerful, so keep those in you. Uh, speak the truth to yourself with these songs. Um, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Uh, and. My old tribe would use this as an argument for acapella music, saying you're only allowed to make music in your heart. That does cause all kinds of gymnastics that we then have to sort out through Old Testament, early church, and the rest. And I've done a couple of Monday morning messages on God and instruments of music, so you can go back and look at those if you wish. Those are still up. The sing and make music in your heart does not mean you don't make music elsewhere. Because the fact is, music is also made by our vocal cords, not in our heart, and by the echo chamber in our teeth and mouth and the formation of the tongue. He wasn't limiting it. He was saying, let it come from your heart. Well, rule of physics, something cannot come out of something unless it was first in there. So get the songs in there. Get the scriptures in there. Um, Ray Bradbury wrote the amazing book Fahrenheit 451 uh, and it's a great story won't go through all of it but books are illegal and therefore if you're caught with a book it, it's horrific what they'll do to you but a secret society exists that reads the books 
but they cannot keep them because it's too dangerous to have them, so they memorize them. They choose which ones. And the main character in his book is introduced to one person, and they shake his hand and they say, I am the book of Job. I love that. They had memorized the book so that the book could live. Denzel Washington, my favorite actor, had a similar endpoint to his book, The Book of Eli. And I won't give any spoilers, even though it's been out for what, 12, 15 years? Um, a very violent film, but there is an incredibly important lesson in it, if you're able and old enough to watch the movie, but able to glean the message there. Getting the word in you so that it lives. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, um, the whole kick here is the more you're thankful and the more you're aware to be thankful, the more thankful you will be. And that's why we thank God for our food. We thank God for the good weather. We thank God for the rain, even when it's inconvenient. We thank God for um, the boys playing out there and the girls playing out there and then they mix and play over here and, and watching them grow in health and in community and in skill. To, uh, we, we celebrate life because there's so much to celebrate. You can always choose what to, what to focus on. We're told to focus on light and to be thankful and let life light spring forth from us. And then verse 21 comes. And this is where a lot of people have trouble with Ephesians. And for good reason. It's because of the way it's handled. Now, when the Bible was written, it was written in all capitals. There were no lowercase letters. There were no spaces. There were no vowels in the Old Testament. Uh, so they're all squished against each other. Just all consonants, no vowels, no spaces, and no syllable breaks. You broke whenever you came to the end of the column. So if you had 30 rows across, no matter where you were in the word, you came back over here and started again, which makes translators work a lot harder, but they're good at it. But then eventually uh, it's translated with big letters and little letters, as we used to say, and putting in spaces. And then uh, many years later, it was divided into chapters. And then many years after that, it was divided into verses. There were more than one person, uh, by the way, that, that worked on this, but the, there is only one person's work on each that really became standard, and that's what we have today. And then later on, because we do these things, the Bible was put into paragraphs, and then people would add paragraph headings over them. There, I'm saying all that to say this. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, says submitting, and that's a, a verb that indicates it is always done. It is a never-ending action. Submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ. Submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. That submission goes all the way back to the first part of the chapter. And what, it, what if some versions do? Well, have a look at this one. They have the verse there, paragraph break, new paragraph heading, and then start talking about wives and husbands. Because of this, people open up their Bibles and they say, oh, wives and husbands. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. Without any of the beginning and the context of this, which is that Christians live a life submitting to others out of love. Christians not just women, all of us. And now he's going to show some practical application of this. I did a Monday morning message on this a long time ago too, but since we're going through the book, we're going to look at it again, shall we? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Well, our, our dear brothers and sisters at the Southern Baptist Church have gotten themselves all wrapped around the axle on this a few times, and the arguments and debates at their conventions are, are painful, and I'm sure they're painful for them. Uh, I, I love them dearly, 
I understand how this happened, but it's not necessary. Submission is not the act of weakness, and it is not something which women are called to, but men are not. Men are absolutely called to submission throughout, the, well, throughout Christianity, but especially in this chapter, and a bit more in the next, if we're, if we're honest. But many people see this first part, and that's all they focus on. It's rather like when Paul tells Timothy that a woman is to learn in silence and that's all the people look at and they don't realize he used the same word for men learning earlier in that chapter. It's just not translated that way as a rule. Again, causing all kinds of problems that didn't need to be caused. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Head. What does head mean? Well, Christ is the head of the church. It brings that up as well, too. Let me ask you, does, did Christ walk around making rules and just say, do this, do this, I have made that decision, you do that? Have you read the Gospels? He didn't. He served. He loved. He cared. He surrounded people for the best for them. He healed others, but he never, never did a miracle to benefit himself. He emptied himself, as Paul will bring up in Philippians chapter 2. And that is how he was the head of the church. If you were to get a thesaurus of the early Greek language here, the first century, and that's not all that early, it was around for a long time. So the, around the time of the first century, a thesaurus of Greek, and you looked up the word head, you would not find the words that come to us. In our little minds, we think boss, chief, in charge of, and the like. In Greek, it would be developer of, protector of, um, the one who lifts up and gives strength to. It is all beneficial. Being the head doesn't mean being the boss. It's responsibility, not rank. It is duty not dominance. Christ is the head of the church. Have you ever met a perfect church? Kind of perfect church? A little perfect church? No. And yet, Christ gave himself up for it and didn't go, well, I'll do it anyway. No, it was with grace, love, and joy. He still intercedes for us. He fills us. We are children of light because of his grace. Now, so what does it mean? Does it mean nothing at all? No, it, there's going to be submission on the other side, though. And that's what I want you to look at here. Christ is the head of the church. Got it. Husbands, love your wives. Here we go. You ready? Just as Christ loved the church. And just in case you didn't catch what that entails, Paul adds, and gave himself up for her. My wife submits to me. She will very often ask me what I'd like here or what do I think about that or the like. But I also submit to her, asking her, what would you like? What do you need? What could make you happier? Is there anything I can do for you? We submit to each other. Of the two, I believe that the men here are required to submit even more. It's never here saying the wife is to give herself up for him. Although I think that's probably implied, it is absolutely stated when it comes to the man. There is, there is no way around it. And then Paul puts this, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless in this same way. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You really need to go look at this. If you've thought the Bible says women are to kowtow to the, the, the big guy in the house. He's saying, guys, because Paul knows men. There are going to be men that will say, well, sure, you'll say you'll give yourself up for your wife, 
but you got a you got a real supportive wife there. No, Paul didn't have a wife. Work with me. Um, you have a real supportive wife, and she's lovely and she's kind. But my wife, she has this problem and that problem. She's always doing this, and she's always and 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 oh my! Don't get me started. He goes, no, no, no. Just like Christ loved the church, when you look at your wife, you consider her holy, clean, no stain, no blemish. It absolutely says it. I um, carry, carried for a long time. I switched this out after a while, and I, I now carry in a phone. But I had a picture in my wallet of my wife for many years. And it was her high school senior picture. And the reason I carried it is because even after 10, 20, 30 years, that's what she still looks like to me. And now after almost 43 years, that's what she still looks like to me. Don't carry the physical picture in my wallet anymore, which is a good thing because my wallet was stolen several months ago and I had to replace everything and I would have hated to have lost that. But with our technology, we were able to take pictures of our pictures and have our pictures. So I still have that. And she, every so often on my anniversary on Facebook, I'll post that and say, this is my girl. This is the girl. And by the way, if you're thinking, oh, she's your property, your girl, you see, you're just living reactively because I'm her boy. I'm her guy. And yeah, I do belong to her. First Corinthians, remember we looked at that, First Corinthians 7. I belong to her, she belongs to me. What of it? She submits to me, I submit to her. Very often at this stage, somebody will run in and say, well, somebody needs to have the final word. I've not found that to be true. There may be incidences where that's gonna to have to happen, but man, that's gonna be a rough day. And I'm not so sure that God did not intend for us to continue to dance this out and to work this out until we come to a consensus. Once again, we are to love them as we love our own bodies. We are to look at them as no blemish, nothing. And here's where Paul says something that people think they got a gotcha on. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And here's where a lot of guys go, oh, no, well, you see, he's speaking in very general terms. He cannot be talking about me because I don't love my body. I don't like, you know, I really wish my body were all kinds of different things than it is. Really? Seriously? You may say that you hate your body, but you still feed it things it likes and you still take it places it wants to go. You even let it watch sports that you enjoy. Do you get the point? He's not talking about that you wish you had more muscles or less gray hair or whatever. He's saying, even with all that's wrong with you, you treat your body as if you love it. Because in, at the root, at the very bottom, you really do. You want it to keep going. Well, you treat your wife that way. Don't point out the errors. Don't point out the issues. And I'll even give you a wee bit of a challenge. Although I wonder if, if anybody would ever take me up on this. I've been recorded for almost 35 years, almost every sermon, almost every class, by somebody. I don't get royalties on anything, and I don't charge for anything. And so they put it up, wherever they want to put it up, online, social media, making CDs or cassettes back in the day. Um, they go back, and you will find many times that I talk about myself uh, and show myself to be a buffoon or to have made an error or to denigrate myself in some way or the other. And I don't look upon that as a negative. I look upon that as humorous and open. But you will never find a place where I say something that's derogatory about my wife. And if my wife were to have two tickets, a car crash, and burn three meals this week, you would never hear of it. Not just in this form, but if you're my friend working with me, you would never hear it. God would never tell you because she is holy, without spot, stain, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. That is my duty before God to her. 
So this is not a passage to beat up women. It's not a passage to beat up anybody. But if there's a burden placed, it's a higher burden on the man to submit more to her than she's submitting to him. We are all members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. And he goes down. This is a profound mystery. In other words, he, knows, he says, I know I'm being a little obtuse here, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now that's an interesting juxtaposition, and we'll look at that, and then we'll close for the date. Men are told to love their wives. Women are told to respect their husbands. Why is this true? Well, while um, outliers exist, the main body of mankind, men desire position, respect, and honor. They, they desire rank. They wanna be thought highly of. Women, again, outliers abound. We're talking about the larger, uh, the larger proportion. Women want to be loved. Of course, men would like to be loved and women would like to be respected. But the way that we go about our lives belies the fact that men desperately want respect. Women want love. And so men are told, you love that woman. And you love her in the way that she feels that she's being loved, by the way. Not love her the way that you feel about it, but the way she feels to make her feel loved. Then. Wives, respect your husbands. It ain't easy being a guy. We are full of angst and elbows. It is just a mess in there. And we are constantly feeling like we are not measuring up or we're the failure. And it, it does not really help that that's, the media feeds this, the husband's the idiot um, in sexuality. You've got ED commercials constantly and women judging the husband for this. And then there's, you know, it's just constant burden on the guy. And you might go, well, poor them, look at all their power. I get that. But can we not just be sympathetic to each other instead of always trying to find a way out of our duty to love the other, to respect the other? I think we can do that. All right, next week, Ephesians chapter 6. Look forward to seeing you there. Cheers. Cheers.